Hi guys, so in the previous video we looked at the concept of an urban heat island and we looked a, took a systems approach. So uh, the urban heat island is quite a well understood system and we do not understand the physics behind it. So once we understand this system it puts us in a lot stronger position to be able to manage that, um, the problems that arise from that and minimise the problems. So in the previous video we looked at the whole city scale, we call that the meso scale or medium scale. And for this video what I'd like to focus on is I'd like to focus in there on the uh, micro scale system. So micro scale, and you would have heard it as microclimates as well, um, we've got uh, the same mechanisms and other mechanisms but they operate slightly differently at the micro scale. So here we can see that already at the whole city level, we've already talked about the importance of albedo. So we can see in this building here, um, we've got those absorbent uh, solar radiation. Uh, that is a low albedo. So uh, at this point here, it's saying the building is very dark. Um, so it will absorb that solar radiation. And then particularly during not the night time, it will release that heat back into the atmosphere as uh, as long wave radiation, and so during the during the night time, we often find that temperatures are two or three degrees warmer in urban areas at night time because that heat is solely released from those buildings. There is that level of complexity. Um, but uh, we've also got windows on buildings and reflective surfaces on buildings. Um, here we can see uh, some examples here. So um, it could be that that uh, reflection, that that solar radiation is reflected off uh, uh, windows and shiny surfaces of buildings. And certainly you will probably have noticed it at times during Hong Kong in a particular time of day. The sun will be striking one of the buildings over on central and then that will f that will uh, shine directly into the school where we are and that can be tremendously annoying. It has actually caused problems for people in extreme circumstances. It's actually caused people to become sunburnt, actually uh, caused the plastic um, parts of cars to melt and has actually melted sidewalks and pavements. There's some pretty famous examples of buildings. Um, I think the Gherkin building in London, um, that caused the street level to actually melt. And there was a case of a hotel in Las Vegas where the uh, shiny building actually concentrated the rays onto the swimming pool. And there were a lot of very badly sunburnt uh, burnt people. Those sorts of things should not happen because we do know this as a system. We know the physics behind it. And really those buildings should have gone into a computer model to predict those sorts of effects. So it's a little bit surprising and a little bit disappointing that in the way that we design our, design our urban environments, we still have this problem. So it is something that should have been predicted and it is definitely something that we can manage and be in a position to be able to reduce. We've also in the previous video talked about the anthropogenic heat generation and here uh, we've got the example of a car but also it um, is air conditioning units if if you live in a tropical country, uh, heating of buildings if you live in, 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 in a cooler country. Something um, that we've also got here are those impermeable surfaces. Um, so that the water cannot get into the soil because it's covered with concrete and tarmac, so impermeable surfaces. We already looked at the impacts in our freshwater unit, the impact of impermeable surfaces. So we have looked at this already. Um, we've also got this reg reduced green and blue space and that causes all sorts of trouble because it's a uh, increases surface runoff, the rivers are going to be more flashy, there's going to be a greater risk of flooding. Also there is less evaporation, um, so actually urban environments with a higher temperature and less evaporation can have quite low levels of relative humidity, um, so that's going to cause a problem. 
Something that we've talked about, a principle that we've talked about in previous lessons, is the concept that any urban area should have at least 20% high quality, public, publicly accessible, open spaces in any urban environment. In Hong Kong, because of the land restrictions, we really do struggle with that. And then finally, um, we go to the uh, right hand side of the diagram and you can see those slow and uh, turbulent winds. So there will be situations where the wind is, wind is slowed, but also we get these turbulence, we call them eddies. There's turbulent eddies where the actually wind gets deflected and, and spins round at street level. Again, this is a problem and we'll be looking at how Hong Kong has tried to reduce that, pro that problem. It's something that is well understood. Um, it can be extremely dangerous. Um, sometimes if the wind is right and the building position is wrong, it can actually easily knock people off their feet at street level. So it can be extremely dangerous and unpleasant. Like I said before, these are well understood things. We understand the systems and really when planning our urban environments, those things should not happen because any new building in urban areas like Hong Kong should be put into a wind tunnel or a computer simulation uh, to determine the risk of having those uh, turbulent airflow. OK, so this video looked at the micro scale. In the next video, we're going to go on to specifically have a look at um, albedo. We're going to have a look at that in a little bit more detail and the concept of the structure of urban surfaces. So that's in the next video.